Okay, hey guys, how you doing? Um, so today we're going to do something that I've been trying to put off for quite some time. Uh, as you can see on the screen, um, I am set up for 10 plus 0, um, which is a 10 control. I don't play, I think I've played 12 games total uh, of rapid play over the past, I don't know how many years on Leech S. Um, but we need to play slightly longer time controls um, so that we're ready for our class, okay, or airports immediately, let's try that again. <laughs> um, but we need to play some more longer time controls to get ready for our class games of the weekend. Um, I will actually need to check what time control is for that actually. I think it's like 90 minutes plus increment per move plus an extra half an hour after 30. I'll need to double check. Okay. So, the one good thing about having this extra time means that I can talk a little bit more. So we start off with the sewing, and it looks like we're going to go for the open sewing. Now I've been playing E6 a lot in sort of bullet and blitz, but we are going to go for the Nidorf, even though I've not been doing that for studying. Um, I've started putting together um, Leeches studies. That I'm going to start working through and sort of change them in um, to a different formats so I can study a little bit better. So for those of you who know this is sewing, is a sort of a way to attack the center without giving up one of our central pawns. So this is the open sewing, which is the best way for white to sort of grab the center early. But the downside is he's giving away one of his central pawns, one of his D or D pawns, so it's D pawn for my wing pawn, my C pawn. Um, but in, um, in compensation he gets Centralised knight, obviously, which I can kick away at some point in most lines. Um, but he sort of gets more control of the centre, and he tends to have a slightly more attacking game. So we're going to knight or six to charge the centre immediately. This is the Nidorf. And it's a flexible session, you can go e5 or e6. b6 or b5, depending on what um, white wants to do. Here we'll go e6. Um, it's like Shevenian style, uh, which sort of fits to what I've been doing. And after f3, he's going to go for sort of quick attack, like an English style attack. Um, and I think what we're going to do is we're going to play b5 just to combat that right, right away. So before playing knight d7, because if I put a knight on d7, then maybe he can go knight d6 in some lines. Um, and you're just going to keep developing. So we've got a nice bishop on a long diagonal, which could cause some issues if he goes a little bit crazy. And he's just going to keep attacking. Um, which I don't think is the worst idea. Um, is this one of the? See, there's some of these lines where you want to play like e5 or d5. So I'm already thinking breaks in the center. Because as a general rule, when your opponent attacks in the wing, you want to break open the center. It's sort of a not a completely hard and fast rule, but a relatively good rule to to be aware of. Um, immediately. I don't know if I want to play d5, because maybe e5, but then are we overextending the, the overextending the king side a little bit? Um, do you know what, let's do that. Can maybe use this diagonal here. F exchanges, I'm quite happy to see that, because this open king could be an issue. But f e5, knight b7, maybe he'll go f4. And again, there's a lot of extension on this king side. And what I'm thinking I might just do here is I might just play fish b7. Just develop a piece. I'm not really threatening the castle, because that's not what I'm doing, but I'm threatening this pawn. Uh, and even if he moves, I might play check just to keep the king from casting. If g5, then we're starting to get a territory of, you know, he's not developing at all. And I can maybe just look at some tactics on here. Potentially, potentially not. But let's develop for now. See where he wants to put his pieces. And I may just quite simply go knight c6. Just finish my development. He's played a lot of moves here. Without accomplishing anything. So if he castles kingside, we just blast things open with the f6 or h6. And if he goes for a queen side castle, I'm more than happy to see that. So knight back to f3. So he has retreated. I'm still not castled, and he's not really threatening f4, I don't think. I said that a little bit too quickly. I don't think he's before. Just take this immediately. 
Yeah, two pink's got enough there. So what I'm thinking here is this bishop wants to come to e3. That's probably what his next move, if he gets a move, will be. So I'm going to play bishop c5. I know it seems a little bit silly going bishop e7, bishop c5. And in most cases, you don't want to move a piece twice, but he's got a piece undeveloped and he's wasted all of these moves. Um, now here, I think we go queen b6, just double up on this. If he goes bishop uh, b2, then we might start thinking about how do we deal with this uncastled king. I think here's where we take a little pause. Okay. So the king is not castled, but we're threatening to castle in the next move. Thinking stuff that might be forward to try and make this a little bit tender. I don't really want to play g6 here. I think that a lot of people approach this as well. I think a lot of people want to react to these sort of pawn stars by moving pawns. But as soon as you move a pawn, you're creating more weakness. Whereas right now, although it seems scary, this is sort of the weak point here. And that's why I was looking at f5. Whereas if I move g6, then... Jesus, I knew things are being tagged on. <laughs> I'm sorry, just being tagged on stuff on Instagram. Um, then maybe h4, and we start to open lines that way. Or even there, you, sa you sack a pawn and open lines, so it can become a little bit crazy. So my idea is that I don't want to deal with that. So I'm thinking of knight b4, to try and pick up the bishop pair. I'm thinking of rook c8. I'm actually thinking about castles queenside. It's a little bit silly as it sounds. But I think my king's more safe there than his is. Um, so what I might do is I might go knight b4 first. Just because I like the idea of having two bishops. And obviously if he's got nowhere to move away because he's always covered. So we'll do that just now. And if we castle, um, then maybe we go queen e5. Maybe we, build, maybe we build up. So he's going to go f5 immediately. Okay. It's not entirely unexpected. Now I do think what we're going to do here is I'm going to grab... Am I? Yeah, so I'm going to grab the bishop here now. Because I think he has to play c takes. If queen takes, then I might go bishop f2 check just as a little in-between move. And I think here, we're going... To say that my king is safer on the queen side than his will be. And my castle queen side. And if he wants to take an open up lines, fine. If he plays f6 and closes lines, fine. Um, and if he castles queen side, then I'm thinking about a little bit of a strange one, but go queen b8. So take the king off the open file and also give the option of my rook coming here. What's interesting is they were talking about this changing chess rules, and one of the rules they proposed was changing how castling works. So obviously castle king said you move the king to rook comes across. Castling queen said the king goes to rook comes across. They said you should have the option of either moving the king here or moving the king here and putting the rook in the square. I think there I would have loved to have that option. <laughs> um, so we are controlling e3. He's got no d4 break. If they manipulate somehow, say he plays rook e1 to try and put a bishop on e3, then we do have d4 to win a piece there. And this, I'm more than happy to see. More than happy to see. So we're going to play... Do we take it, actually? Mm, that's a good question. I was about to play that very fast. Now, do you know what? He has no play on the side of the board. Let's play g6. If he wants to go here, that's fine. But now, his pawns are on dark squares, just like his bishop. So it's reducing the scope of his piece. Whereas I've got two bishops, not blocked in. Um, here... He wants to take, obviously. Do something better than rook c8. Do we have anything? So he wants to open up the file here. I want to go after this pawn somehow. Go queen e4. B4, where's this knight going? Maybe it's like that here. Can you take there? So what I'm thinking is if queen there, does he play knight takes d5? If so, I think I take here. And I'm happy to exchange that way and the king's open. 
So I think that's all good. And if queen e5 and he doesn't do that, then maybe b4 is a threat to win this pawn. Or if he plays e3, I might play b4 anyway to try and loosen up the king. Did he play d5? Do you know what? Let's play here um, just to try and build up pressure. One of the ideas of takes, takes. I was thinking that he takes and we take here. But here, right, but there, sorry. Um, I don't actually mind that because then I get the open file. So he's playing king b1. Makes sense. Um, I need to play faster. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange these pieces here to put the queen behind the bishop. That way, that way it's a strong, stronger option in this diagonal if I want it. And it might mean that we have to double pawns here. So after this, after this, let's maybe just get the king off that file. Yeah, just to get this out here. No messing around. It's not really doing anything here. So here. So I kind of want to take this, open up, open up the position a little bit, here we'll drop back. And now we have a nice open file with a lot of pieces. If it wants to take it twice, that's fine. So this is not very good, this is not very good, but I think we can get them out if we are smart about it. I'm just going to go back to f8, we are still scoping that pawn. If b4, maybe go a5. No, not quite yet, but potentially in the future. If I b4, then we're going to manipulate our knight into c4. That's probably what we'll do. Here, we talked about this sort of idea of opening the king. Just try and play a little bit faster. Knight c4, knight takes c4, rook c4, and we can start entering into the game this way. And pawn takes, then we go bishop c3, control all these squares, control this open file here. And if queen d2, little threat, queen e4 check, picking up this knight. I can imagine playing something like this to try and trade queens here. So this, not the easiest to defend, this knight. Hard to get into the game, like you know, trying to get into this square, for example. So here, do we play check? I think we do. I think we'll check. Then we go bishop here, attacking the queen. And we're going to go. Check here. He's going to push here, probably. Maybe. Nope, he's going to take and allow this end game. Okay, perfect. I'll show that afterwards. Just because I need to play a little bit faster here, just to make sure I don't flag. King free, I'm going to go here, which will actually threaten mate. If knight here, we're just going to step over one, stop the entry. We are going to threaten, but oh, it's not threatening me. It's close to threatening me. Yeah. How do you stop this? Okay, and if I attack that. Now we win by force this way. Tremendous. Okay, good game. Okay guys, welcome to our analysis a long time after the fact. Uh, it's about an hour after I played that game. And my intention was, um, and I did, 
go on mid lens analysis so I can show you how I do an immediate post mortem, how I go through the game, what my settings would be on Stockfish, etc. But I initially had problems uh, with Stockfish just not loading or not showing lines, even though it said it was loaded. I managed to fix those, did what I thought was a very good analysis, and then it turns out the recording didn't work. It was about 10 seconds, 15 seconds delayed on everything that I was doing, moves weren't appearing on the board. So that didn't work either. So I've turned the engine off. Um, hopefully though, as you sort of see above me here, I think it saved the analysis. So I think that we should get relatively accurate um, evaluations to what I was seeing just in this recording. So hopefully that's absolutely fine. Um, in general, when I'm going through games, um, I use five lines of Stockfish. So I open up the system see above me, show five lines, put it to the high, the highest step possible. Um, in order to try and get an accurate reading. Someone a lot smarter than me can explain exactly how it works, but it, I think that it does have to do with how good your computer is, but also how fast the server is, how much how much time you give the engine um, as to how accurate it's going to be. Um, and I tend to do that rather than use game review. Um, but even Stockfish can be a little bit inaccurate. Um, and that's... Sorry, guys, I'm going to start this off with a rant. Um, the issue I have with Stockfish is that it sometimes does silly things. So, for example, I had a game the other day which started off with 1c4, the English opening. Um, no, I wasn't playing against Jamie, um, but somebody played the English opening against me. And here I play a whole lot of different things. I'll play c5, I'll play e5, I'll play e6, uh, e6 I'll play knight f6, I'll play whatever I feel like. And for a reason, I felt like playing uh, d5 on this day. Now, if you watch above me, the Stockfish evaluation, and this is accurate, I've tested this a few different times at different depths, goes from... 0.2, plus 0.2 for white, and you play d5, goes to plus 0.9, which is an inaccuracy. So on move 1, I was given an inaccuracy for this game. My favourite part is the top engine move is c takes d5, and the instant you play that, goes to plus 0.5. So immediately after you play the top move, it fixes the evaluation, but you still keep the inaccuracy. So it's a little bit disingenuous. And the thing I thought was funny in doing this little bit of research, as I found that the move h6 is better, according to Stockfish, the move a6 is better, and the move I think a5 is also absolutely fine. You will be happy to know that moves like g5 uh, are still considered blunders, but you can get away with playing h6 in this position, and Stockfish will not consider you to have played in accuracy, which is just fantastic. But yeah, enough of me ranting about um, computers, and we will go back to the game. Uh, you'll see just underneath um, my face, I've got the opening explorer open, um, and I have the LeechS database set up to show um, blitz and slower games uh, for 2000 rated and above, um, just so I can see what people are in my level playing. It's all well and good seeing what grandmasters are playing, it's all well and good having my openings book, etc., to see what the correct line is, but oftentimes moves which I think are completely logical and people my level are think are completely logical aren't shown by Stockfish or the Grandmasters. So I think it's quite important to see that in some cases. But I'll also keep um the master tab open as well just to sort of look at the recent uh, recent trends even. Um, so we start with E4, let's talk about the game, went for the Sicilian. Um I don't think I talked about it during the game. Sorry this is like the eighteenth time I've done this recording. Um but I was playing the can the sewing can for a long time with e6 and I've stopped playing this line uh, essentially because of one particular variation which is the Maroxy bind and this is um, a very good system against the can where you control the space in the centre, these pawns control a whole lot of, um, whole lot of area um, a lot of the ideas in sound involved in playing b5 to be active, maybe go to b4 here you need to go b6 and you get a little bit cramped in the position. Now this is fine for black if you play it correctly, but I found that there was a lot of subtle manoeuvring that I didn't really understand. You know, does the bishop go to e7 or c5 or b5? I don't really know um, what's correct in a lot of positions. Um, sometimes you go in b6, bishop b7. Sometimes you go in d6, bishop d7. Sometimes the knight goes to d7. Sometimes it goes to c6. And it becomes very, very complicated and there's a lot of manoeuvring. And there's a lot of nuances that I don't really understand too much. So I just don't, I want to sort of avoid this system. Um, so I do this by playing the the Nidorf Sazoing, which is this variation with a6. And they might be saying, can't you do the same thing? 
technically yes, um, but here after knight c6, you need to sort of waste moves playing knight b3. You can eventually manipulate so you get c4, but you need to make some concessions in order to do so, and maybe it gives black time to play you know e5, d5. I think the computer's top line is playing g6 here and playing it like a dragon. Um, but it, it just takes a lot of time to manipulate, so it's not quite as scary. Um, so we go into the uh, the Nidorf here, white plays bishop d3, there's a whole lot of theory here. Um, for those interested, you know, you think, should you play bishop e2, should you play bishop e3, bishop g5, um, should you go bishop c4, um, should you go queen e2 uh, in some of these lines, which is a little bit weird. Um, is it queen e2 in this line? I don't think it's this line. But you can go g3, you can go f4, you can do a whole load of things. Um, I think a3 has been one that Carlson has been playing recently. There's a whole lot of theory, which I'm not going to go into. So just know that all these sort of things are on my radar. Uh, so bishop d3, perfectly normal, defending the pawn. Um, one thing, you know, this does connect, disconnect the queen and the knight, so maybe knight c6 is on my radar a little bit more than it would have been, because otherwise I go to knight d7. Um, but I'm just going to continue with the natural e6. So this is like the Schwenigen style uh, Nidorf. The usual move is e5, that's the main line. Um, and this is absolutely fine, you know the knight goes back to b3 or e2 or f3 or even into f5, it's a bit of a weird line, but I think the main line is knight e3. And you just continue to develop normally, uh, it was a bishop e7, castles, and then do castles trigger, bishop e6. Well, something like bishop e6 first. This is absolutely fine um, for black, but you do have this sort of weak pawn here, and f4 does now attack e5. It comes a little bit more double-edged. And I just made the decision not to go down that line. And this um, Schwenigen style Nidorf is what Kasparov used to play. Um, so it's sort of quite nice that I'm looking over some of his games. He's now got his book on um, it's uh, Kasparov's Greatest Chess Game. So I'm reading through that just now. It's not his book. I think it's written by someone else. Um, but I'm reading through that just now. Um, and also look at some games of MVL. Uh, I think MVL tends to be E5 though. Um, but quite a flexible system. Now here he plays f3, which I thought during the game was a little bit odd. I didn't sort of say it because in my head there's every move under the sun, but it's actually never been played at master level. Um, sort of more natural move, castle. Um, is a perfectly normal move. f4 is a completely normal move. The line that I quite like is queen e2, um, which is probably what I would have played just to give the option of both castles, king side, and potentially queen side. You're still deciding where you want this bishop to go, if it's e3 or if it's in g5, which is quite a nice flexible move. And the queen does do a good job here, quite centralised, maybe um, supporting e5 at some point. So that's probably where I'd be playing. But f3 um, seems perfectly fine. Uh, I did take this chance to go b5. Um, don't think I need to react too badly, I think c6 is fine as well. b5, perfectly logical, as I was saying during the game, put the bishop on the good diagonal. Still need to decide where this knight's going. And have the flexibility to put this where I want. G4, very aggressive. Um, in my head, too aggressive. I think he's getting a little bit overextended here. Um, and I'm quite happy just to continue development. Um, I did talk about it briefly during the game, I think. Um, but keeping these pawns on the starting squares is sort of counterintuitive, I guess. A lot of people see an attack and want to react. So they see these pawns coming all the way down and think, must do something. But as soon as you move a pawn, you're creating an anchor for them to attack. So if I play g6, the wings are here and here. If I play h6, at some point g5 is going to come where you need to take or they take and you recapture. So any sort of move these pawns can create a weakness. So I've decided just not to react and just continue development. Um, and here we continue with h4. Now, really irritatingly... Um, the best move in this position is something that I should have looked at. Because um, I immediately played d5, or not immediately, but I played d5 pretty quickly, I think. Um, you know, considering the position. I think b4, yeah, b4 was the move given. I'm going to turn this off now because we're sort of out of theory. Um, but b4 was the move that um, was played previously, which kind of makes a little bit of sense uh, to try and dislodge this knight. But I feel like usually it's to open up a weakness on e4 which it doesn't really exist because of the double defense here so it's not really a candidate move of mine um h5 was another thing which is fine for black but i didn't really want to again sort of move these pawns create a weakness but it's absolutely fine after either takes or advance 
black's doing perfectly fine. Um, I just didn't want to go into the lines where you're opening up the G file. Um, but the plan that I should have played, um, which is something that I've actually looked at recently, was Knight BD7. And the reason it should have been in my head is because the last game I looked at was a game which was Short versus Kasparov in their uh, World Championship, the World Championship Kasparov organised after leaving FIDE. The two of them played, I think that's, yeah, I think it's one after one. Um, and the idea is that you can go into E5 or C5, so Kasparov chose to go this route in his game. Um, but utilising the E5 square is something that particularly the computer likes. Obviously attacking his bishop on d3, attacking his pawn on f3, you've got an eye on the c4 square, which is a good outpost, um, and sign a lot of variations. And just in general, getting the knight to the centre of the board where it's got a lot more scope to, to do um, a lot more. Um, it just makes sense, and it was on my radar, um, it did sort of cross my mind that the knight should be developed before breaking open. But the fact that it wasn't higher up on my list um, says a lot. I sort of did this reflexively. Uh, I don't think d5 is necessarily too bad. I can talk about the concept of opponent attacks in the wing open up the centre. But maybe that was a little bit superficial because there isn't really an attack. So maybe I was just trying to logic my way into sort of gaining some space in the centre. Um, but I think this is absolutely fine. Um, e5. Um, yeah, so this is all pretty much four. So knight d7, f4. Um... Yeah, there's no other good way to like Bishop f4, defending with the pieces just causes issues. You're still at the back of his pawn on f3. And I can gang up on this knight here, which is what I should be doing right now. Um, so even if if this is well, same, same sort of idea, I think. I should be going after this um, weak piece, because this is uh, a piece that's unguarded in the centre of the board. And so I should be using that to my advantage. And the computer likes just bishop c5 is a nice simple move. And then... You can probably put the bishop on b6 and then maybe put the knight into c5 from here. And again, sort of similar idea, keeping an eye on the central squares. The exchange isn't too bad for me. This bishop's very, very good in this open line. This bishop comes very good in this open line. Um, so that's something I should have been looking at. And something that really interested me was the computer's evaluation of this position. Because there's a very important point that I didn't even consider. And when the computer suggested it, I was like immediately a bit flabbergasted because the move once you play is bishop b3, um, and it took me a second to figure out what the hell's going on here because it's just trying to give up pawn h4, and I really wish you could see the reaction. I tried to manipulate to show you the reaction because I was very impressed by this because I, I think it's a really cool idea. The idea is that after bishop take king d2, but I think I think if king e2 is technically the slightly better move, but I prefer king d2 because. I know better than the computer, obviously. Just, um, just aesthetically, I think it looks better with the queen open. Um, but the idea is that we're going to threaten to go g5 as white, and this bishop's going to be sort of trapped offside. And we're going to, you know, if you leave it there, eventually it'll be picked up because you can't bring it in because the queen will come and attack. And obviously the rook's attacked here because the only piece defending it is this queen. Um, and if you retreat then you're going to lose this pawn on h7. And it may seem like, oh, you want a pawn, I want a pawn, fine. But here we're actually in a lot of trouble, because here, white's completed his development, white gets to these open squares first, so that sort of the queen, the rook can come to open files, however you want to do it, f5 comes quite quickly, all the pieces are developed and centralised, and this king's still in the centre. And you've got to get two pieces out of the way, the queen and the knight, in order to castle. And in that time, maybe you build up a type, maybe you play f5, maybe you target these weak squares now on g7 and f7. And white's got a quite significant advantage here. And I thought that was quite interesting because I was just very superficially looking at I win a pawn, the king has to move. But the computer absolutely loves this for white, which I think is very interesting. The one I did look at was it this I was looking at. I forget. Um, but it just becomes an absolute mess. And even in those variations, the bishop's offside. So I thought that was very interesting and instructive from the computer just to say that development, ironically, king safety, because king's very, very safe on d2 or e2. Um, so development, king safety, and space just becomes more important than this pawn. And for that reason, I probably should have played just bishop c5. And and there, we start to struggle because bishop e3 doesn't work because queen b6. So I'm the one that 
gets the advantage on development, gets these nice bishops on good squares, um, and yeah, that should have been my my plan. Uh, but there we are. So unfortunately, you know, or fortunately for me, my opponent didn't see that that was a good idea, because I definitely would have taken it and probably ended up a lot of trouble. And he plays g5. Um, very, very overextended. Again, I'm trying very hard to not move these pawns, just not create a weakness. Uh, I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, and here, I thought just finished development, which made sense to me. Um, I think if takes bishop c6, uh, I think this is absolutely fine. Now this bishop becomes an absolute monster. There's no more blockading piece on d4. I can maybe go b4 at the right moment. This bishop can maybe go to c5. Queen goes to b6. I think I've got a very, very, very good position here. And I'm very happy to, uh, if he takes there. The best move the computer gave, which is a move that... Um, I don't think a lot of people would sort of consider it as actually knight c2. You take this piece that isn't attacked on c3, you think it's a good square on c3, oh, and you drop it back. But this is the important knight, this is the one that's um, central, and this is the one that's controlling a lot of squares, so you want to keep a knight on this square. So I thought it was quite instructive for the computer, and I think there's a random line I looked at, which... Wait, why is this here? Sorry, one second, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Oh, I think this was the line the computer gave as the top line. This wasn't me analysing, this was computer analysis, which is a little bit crazy. Um, and I think it gave just about equal in this position. I, I can't actually remember, I don't have a valuation here. But that was a computer line um, that it was given as the best continuation there. Um, after knight f3, um, the computer really likes my position. But again, these are, this is just me being a little bit rusty in these uh, Sicilian systems, you know, I've been playing so much bullet with playing, you know, d6, g6, playing the French. Knight c5 should be such a natural move here. It really should be such a, such a, such a natural move. Um, going after this bishop, controlling this good square, potentially coming to e4, um, potentially playing b4, now the knight can't go to a4. Um, yeah, that's going to be something I should be looking at right away, but then I even think queen b6 is going to be a little bit of an improvement if I wanted to stop this um, bishop b3. Um, it's still doing the same sort of thing, but it, get, it gives me the option of playing knight c5 if I want. It also does open up the opportunity to castle, um, maybe rook c8. So if I was going to play this plan of preventing e3, which I think is a good plan, potentially being queen b6 first was slightly more accurate um, if I wanted to do it this way. But yeah, nice instructive moment there. Nice c5 is probably a little bit away. But um, I'm still quite happy here. I'm still I'm still doing quite well. Queen e2, queen b6, bishop d2. This is all quite normal. Um, and here I played knight b4, which I still thinks not too bad a move. I think that going after this bishop is maybe again a little bit superficial. It's not really got too many prospects. Um, and maybe I should be looking to. Again, sort of free up this c5 square to put a knight onto it. Um, the computer gives knight d4, um, which I think makes quite a bit of sense. Uh, I think the knight takes us forced here. Don't really think there's a good way to. Because like queen, yeah. So if queen f2 takes, for example, takes, and then maybe d4 works. I don't know. Uh, not quite, but th I think that um, White's in a bit of trouble if he doesn't take. What to take takes. Um, I quite like this position, so now we're attacking both sides of the board with the bishop, it's quite hard to dislodge here. Um, I think a lot of lines that uh, white plays in d1, which is a little bit crazy trying to dislodge with c3. I can maybe push b4, I can maybe put a bishop on c6 to control more squares here, um, which is quite good. I can put a knight on c5, I can put a rook on c8, and here doing quite well. Uh, so knight b4, maybe slightly loose. Um, f5, and here... Um, so I think that, objectively, I knew that taking was absolutely fine. Um, and after takes, everything's absolutely fine here. Uh, for black, there's no threat of e6. Um, but just optically, I didn't really like how this was going. So I think the, the, the continuation is like this. Like I saw the exchange. Um, but for me... Optically, with the king in the centre, the queen bearing down, active pieces around, I didn't really like how this was looking. And I just feel like, in a lot of these um, Sicilian games, e6 is something you need to be very aware of, um, threatening to either open up this way, or if you take them, or opening up a different way. 
so I didn't really want to go down uh, that road. Um, so instead, I decided Knight takes d3, it's maybe a little more concrete. Um, as the c takes d3, now I should have taken. Because now one of the good attacking pieces is gone. I'm still controlling these squares with this good battery here. Um, e6 is covered twice, both by the queen and by the pawn. So I'm controlling all the nice key squares. You get no like knight d4. There's no break on the king side. And at some point, if I have to castle, I can castle away from a lot of threats. Um, I'm playing maybe d4 or b4, probably d4 in this position because now this pawn is covered. Uh, this is covered. So probably should have taken this opportunity to to do so. Uh, what was it given this variation? I think it was giving. Oh, it was giving this as the continuation to force um, e6. And yeah, this becomes very double edge, but the king becomes safe. And I thought this was this looks absolutely fine for black. And I've got loads of open attacks going on here. Um, so yeah, in hindsight, should have went down this line, but king safety also quite important. So I decided to go for this. Um, and here I think I talked about not being worried about f6. Um, ironically, I was going to do like I did in the game, play g6, but as we'll talk about a little bit later, I should be taking this. Um, but instead, white castled, and here, um, no, not here, is it here? No, sorry, brain having a moment here. Um, so I think here just wants to play d4, just gain space this way. I wasn't really sure. Yeah, I'm still not convinced. I, I don't know why, but I'm still not convinced by this. But maybe the fact that you're just getting open lines this king is just very good. It takes knight, takes the knight, is doing an absolute monster job in c5. Okay, the, the more I talk about it, the more I think the d4 probably was best. I just wanted to kind of get out of dodge. King b8 in my head, just opening up this file makes sense. Um, f6. Uh, now here is where I am a little bit annoyed at myself. Because I was talking so much, I have talked so much, about not creating weaknesses here. And at this point, my move g6 does exactly that. Because um, here, uh, h4 is just going to force the issue if h4 takes h6. Takes. This is just causing all sorts of issues with two weak pawns here. I'm just going to gang up somehow, you know, however he wants to essentially. This could be a threat in some variations. Um, and white's just doing very well. And if late in the game we take take, then we have this weak pawn in f7 which, as I'll show, could really uh, turn into an issue at some points. Um, so I instead... Wait, there's a... So yeah, g6, h4. Yeah, so I should, I should have been taking. Sorry, it's what I should have been doing. Taking, and then the computer gave e takes. Um, I can't remember what the issue with g takes was. I think it's potentially just that this is a weak pawn, it's hard to push d4. Yeah, so I think here... White's doing quite well. I get to the G file first. I can use the C file. It becomes very, very good. So it gives E takes is the best move, which to me I'm absolutely fine with. I can go like rook E8. I can maybe go bishop D6. I might try and play E5. I can play rook C8. And I'm just quite happy with the position. I think we'll go, go to bishop C6 as well, like I did in the game. So I was quite happy with that. Um, but we again go for rook C8. Uh, Computer wants bishop c6, we'll talk about why that's interesting <laughs> in a little second. Um, but so rook c8, king b1, now I play bishop c6, and now we go bishop f4. And now we talk about why bishop c6 was always on the computer's radar. And this is something that I'm actually a l quite annoyed that um, I didn't play, um, because... It's a move that's been on my radar the whole game. It's been a move that I've talked about many times in this analysis. It's an idea that's very common in the Sicilian. And for those of you who haven't seen it, it's just b4. Um, because this bishop covers the only now escape square. So the king took one of the squares. That one defends this. Uh, this pawn defends that. Everything, everything defends that. And now the bishop covers this. So this knight is now trapped. Um, so yeah, uh, the line the computer gives is, uh, I think d4, I've got it here, d4, b takes c3, d takes c5, knight takes c5, and here, 
yeah, the White King is much more in danger than the Black King. Black King, uh, Black pieces are very active. Um, the fact that I've done this silly move to create weakness doesn't matter in this position. So yeah, after all, all that hard work essentially to make B4 be a threat, I decided not to play it. Um, so I think it gave yeah, so it gave A3 to try and stop. And then it wants me to play a5. I think I probably would have played b4, which the computer thinks is a blunder, I believe. I, uh, I don't stockfish active, but I probably would have played this just to try and open things up and go a little bit crazy. But there we are. So king e7, and according to the computer, I've given up all my advantage here. Um, d4, and again, it just wants me to go bishop. I, I don't know why I'm trying to be so fancy in my in my head. Um, wait. Oh no, we did play bishop before. Oh, it was afterwards, sorry. But afterwards, it does a different move to bishop c1. That's what it was. So bishop b4 is absolutely fine. Rook c1. Bishop b7, it just wants me to take. And rook takes. I think this is very good. Uh, which I can sort of understand. I think it's wanting me to put a knight potentially into c4, which could be quite nice. But b4 straight. That's actually probably quite good. b4 um, straight away. Rook treats somewhere. And I take bishop b5 of a temple. That's probably quite good. Just opening lines to the king, and then this bishop's quite silly over this side of the board. Okay, that's that's probably where we go with that. So the bishop b7, I just want to open up lines. h takes, h takes, rook takes, h takes, rook takes, h8. And now there's an idea here, and it revolves around this weak pawn. And this is something I didn't really see, because I'm thinking to myself, this bishop, terrible piece blocked in behind. I've got a nice attack with some open lines. I've got the two bishops, which, although close position just now, could be kind of thing. Um, but after the best move for white here, which is not a3, like you played the game, a3 is a good move, but not the best. The computer wants white to play knight d1. And again, this is another moment where the computer just amazes me sometimes with ideas, because it doesn't really care about looking fancy or looking good or whatever but this is such a good idea about not exchanging pieces when you've got more space because if you've got more space like white does you want to have more pieces to use the space whereas if you exchange those pieces and it doesn't matter that i've got less space i don't need the space because i've not got many pieces but keeping the piece on the board fantastic but the other idea which is absolutely insane is to go after that pawn in f7, uh, either by going this way or by you can do the same thing with uh, knight h2, knight g4, knight h3, which to me is absolutely insane because I've got no really good way to attack this other than tying a piece down to it, like I tie my rook down to it. This knight can't defend it, this bishop, pretty much impossible to get back to the square to defend it. But either way, it's gonna be very, very passive. The only other thing to do is go bishop f8 and then take it. But if I do that, then he gets on. Pass pawn, pass protected pawn on h6 because the bishop defends it, and you still just maneuver this knight into g5 and go after the f7 pawn. So, this was again another moment where, as much as I insulted the computer earlier for being silly, it does come up with very concrete ideas, um, which I think is very impressive. So, that's something I didn't think about at all, but I think it's very, very cool. So, knight d1 to go. Uh, Wait, where am I going? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Knight d1, I can't think of the piece of move. Knight d1 to g4 to h6. <laughs> so what's my path again? Um, but yeah, that's very impressive. But also very, very impressive, that sort of um, manoeuvre, but also the instructiveness of keep pieces on the board when you have more space. Um, and that's again why, potentially, in this position, I should have even played bishop takes c3, because I should have recognised I have less space. Forget about the two bishops, forget about that. I have less space, I need to have less pieces to, to use my space more effectively. Um, instead, we get this position with a back on f1. Um, so yeah, so a3, bishop f8. Uh, and it goes bishop d2, um, which I didn't really understand. Um, b4. Again, I'm just trying to open up lines. Uh, I think it wants me to play... Yeah, 94. 94 was probably the best. And after queen e5, the best way to defend this pawn, this is pinned, and then you can sort of unwind by playing queen d1, and you still have this idea, um, this silly, silly, silly idea rerouting the knight to h6. 
um, and you have this open thing all to yourself. This file is not really doing much for me at the moment in these positions. Um, so yeah, that would be quite a good way for him to play it. Uh, after he takes, bishop takes. Uh, so here again, it just wants bishop c6. It wants me to take advantage of these squares first. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really understand that too much. I didn't look too much into those lines, so I, I don't have the full computer analysis for you there. But I suppose it makes sense to, again, sort of activate pieces where you can. And actually... Stop a4, just a little bit simpler actually. Maybe a little bit easier to complain. Sorry, 94. To stop 94 is what I was trying to say. So it's maybe a little bit easier to explain than um than I thought. Um so bishop takes four, knight four, twenty five, bishop takes queen takes, knight c five, um, which I was happy to see. Um just exchange pieces and now I think my pieces are a little bit more active. Bishop c6 finally, um rook c3. Um, it wants queen e3, um, which sort of makes sense. Cover the pawn of the queen, cover this rank here. Maybe go queen c3 next. No, you can't go queen c3 next. It's the same. The trick I was talking about in the game maybe works not quite then, actually. Hmm, maybe if you're. I should have looked into this a little bit more, but I think this is interesting. Maybe I go rook. Maybe we've got rook b8. I think this is very double edged. And I think maybe. Maybe I turned the computer off too early here. <laughs> um, okay, let me have a look at this afterwards. But I think this is an interesting position. Um, potentially for you. Um, unclear. Unclear. Um, but rook c3, yeah, definitely a mistake. And here. Another move that I really, really, really should have seen, um, which is, if you want to try and find it for yourself, so I think I played rook h1, yeah, so I played rook h1 here, um, but instead d4, just a very, very, very strong move, and the idea is the rook has no good squares. Um, if you drop all the way back, then I'm just going to play d3, and I'm going to utilize this if I can, possibly. And if you want to try and, I'll try to, what was the line I was looking at? Queen d, whatever it is. Uh, I think you go here, and you're just kind up and absolute everything. Um, if rook, oh sorry, if rook f4, then I'm taking this. Then you're attacking the queen, attacking the rook. So you're going to win, uh, uh, win the rook there, and then other moves like. Rook d3, for example, you go bishop here, f rook here, uh, here, you queen d3, I think you went d3 again. I forget the line, but this is just all very, very good for white. Um, in fact, no, here, sorry, here, I think there was rook h1. Yeah, rook h1, and there's no good way to stop this, so check. Oh, I may have to do some calculating here. Uh, so check, and then you have to go d3. Ah, check, takes, check. If we start doing all this nonsense, then just pick up everything. And if you try and exchange queens, I get this at the end of the line. Okay, okay. That took longer than I had to there. Um, would I find that with a minute and whatever left my book? Probably, actually, except I'm sorry. Rook h4 was on my radar, so I probably would have at that point. But yeah, d4. Very, very good move, just opening up this bishop, allowing absolutely everything, utilising these sweet squares. I can use this check at whatever time I want. I can utilise the fact that I can play rook b8. So that would be a very nice find. Uh, didn't find it, obviously. <laughs> King e2. Uh, I think I just want rook c1. Yeah, I just want rook c1. And it's. I think it gives black as being very, 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 very marginally better. Um, but it's, yeah, I think this is going to be a draw in the end. But hey, we um, we don't mind when our opponent blunders. Uh, again, just play d4. Again, this idea should be very clear. Um, I do go for the idea, I do play bishop b5, because I'm obviously trying to get into this square. But, you know, this is just a much more forcing, accurate way to do it. So, bishop b4. Uh, and then we play queen c2. Yeah, so it wants queen f2. Um, 
here. So queen f3, queen c2, going to play. So instead, it wants um, queen c2. Sorry, it wants queen f2. This gets confusing with less beautiful balls to um, take advantage of this pin here. I still think this is probably fine. Yeah, I'm not going to go there yet. Oh, it gives me the line, actually. I don't need to do it. I don't need to do any work. Stockfish has given me the line. Queen f2, bishop c4, queen takes queen takes b3, queen c3, c6, king a8, knight g1, queen c1, c7, queen takes c7, queen two, h4. Yeah, and I'm absolutely fine with this position. Uh, the exchange and a pawn up. Yeah, okay, fine. Uh, queen c2. Um, now, mate number one, which I had seen, is after b3. Um, so if you want to take a little second to... Find that one. Found it yet? Uh, so b3, queen a, uh, queen a4, uh, utilizing the fact that this is pinned. Obviously, can't go here because of the queen. You can't go to any squares of the back right because of the rook. So you must go king b2, and it's queen a mate. Uh, the one that I decided not to play, and by decided I mean I saw this was winning, so I played it. Um, Obviously, in a longer time control game, if I had more time, I would take a little second and probably calculate this. Because um, d takes c4 is uh, just fourth mate. But you see a way to win, you play it. That's, you know, I think that finding the best win, the fastest win, you know, if you find a mate in six rather than a mate in ten, it doesn't really make a difference unless you're playing stupidly fast. And with a minute 47, I know I can win this end game in that amount of time, so I was quite happy to, to just play that quite quickly. But we do have b takes c4, uh, and then almost queen knight g1 to try and save some pieces. Queen c3, because the idea that we just can't stop is queen a4. And then after we defend this way, we go into d1, and we're threatening mate here. This pawn defends the only escape square. So we're going to sacrifice our queen. Uh, sacrifice our queen. Uh, the threat is still mates here. Oh, oh sorry, can't move because the it's my move. Um, but also, no matter what, that's checkmate. And if uh, king three, that's checkmate as well. Um, so yeah, that was the game. I'm not going to go through all this. I don't think. I think this is relatively trivial. Um, I do know that people will play on here, but in general. There's no way for this knight to get my pawns, so in the worst case scenario, everything on this side of the board gets traded, and I pick up everything, I pick up all the pawns of my rook. You know, I put a rook here, uh, which is attacking both these pawns, and stopping the knight from defending, so I pick stuff up, and then pass pawns uh, are made to be pushed. So, quite trivial after this. Um, but yeah, hope you enjoyed this, hope you liked a bit more of an analysis um, uh, sort of style video. And hopefully see a couple more analysis next week, um, depending on how well my games go. Um, or how interesting my games are at the weekend, I should say. Um, if they're instructive, then I'll definitely post them. But if they're boring, maybe not, but we'll see. But yeah, thanks guys.